Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my derivation of the Fourier transform. This is video number two of three, and I'm going to discuss Fourier integrals. In the previous video to this, video number one of three, I did a der or excuse me a revision of Fourier series. So in that, I discussed the definition of Fourier series and how we derived the coefficients a sub n, b sub n, and a sub zero. I also discussed the concept of basis functions, the cosines and sines, and the concept of the frequency domain. And finally also discussed the Fourier cosine and sine series, and that's something which will be very important towards the latter part of this particular video. Before I continue, I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all my videos archived and listed, and they may be of use to you there. Before we begin, I'd like to do a small revision of video number one of three, in terms of the frequency domain and basis functions. So we're well used to using the i hat, j hat and k hat vectors in order to describe the Cartesian space. But if you're using, if you're dealing with something which has spherical symmetry, it's often good to use the unit vectors r hat, theta hat, and phi hat. So these would be your basis vectors for your Cartesian space. Of course, they are equivalent. Or if you want to have, if you have cylindrical symmetry, you might use r hat, theta hat, and z hat. The important point to note here is that all of these vectors are able to describe your space or be a basis for your space because they are orthogonal. And I showed in the last video that cosine and sine are orthogonal in a mathematical sense. This means that we can use cosine and sine as a basis for a space, but they're no longer vectors, they are functions. So we speak about them as being the basis functions for our space and that is only possible because they are orthogonal in a mathematical sense. Also we saw that because the argument of cosine and sine had to be dimensionless, we had to divide by something which had the inverse units of our function, in other words a frequency. So we, we saw that we were actually going from our time domain to our uh, temporal frequency domain or from our spatial domain to our spatial frequency domain. And this is something which Fourier series introduced ever before the Fourier transform did. So let's move on. Fourier series describe periodic functions. Most functions, however, are aperiodic. So how do we make a link between periodic functions and aperiodic functions? We can consider the period going to infinity. And we could suggest that if the period goes to infinity, we have the link between a periodic and an aperiodic function. So let's just remind you what the Fourier series of a function looks like. So we have at the bottom of your screen f of t. So this is the Fourier series of f of t. Now because this is the periodic function f of t, I'm going to give it the subscript l. If there is no subscript l, that means you're talking about the aperiodic function of t. So this is going to be a0, or perhaps a0 over 2, depending on your definition. And then we're going to have the infinite sum of a sub n cos n pi t over l plus b sub n sine n pi t over l. Remember, of course, that we have particular integrals to perform in order to evaluate a sub 0, a sub n, and b sub n. As I said a moment ago, if your function is, is a function of t, which is perhaps measured in seconds, then L must be measured in per second or hertz. So we're talking about a frequency. So we're going time to temporal frequency or space to spatial frequency, depending on what the variable of your initial function is. Now, we're here to discuss Fourier integrals, which means we're trying to go from a sum to an integral. In order to do this, we need to look at the discrete component in our Fourier series. Well, the discrete component, of course, is omega, or is our frequency, 
because our frequency depends on the discrete variable n. So I'd like to remind you how that is the case. Let's go back up here and define n pi over l as our angular frequency. And if we do that, we are, we are able to make the following expression. So you have cosine and sine of omega t. And that, of course, can, that this should be omega s of n and k sub n. Now, the link between the angular frequency and the linear frequency is made through the expressions I've written here, which I'm not going to go through. But of course, you can feel free to do that if you require.